The Has Been Show with me, Martin Beans Ward. The podcast that travels in the back of a van. Hello and welcome to The Has Been Show. This episode is a very deep and dark one. It tells of the story of the rape and abuse of children, of mothers, of young girls, young boys, in Irish institutions run by the church. Of course we're talking about the mother and baby homes. The language in this episode may be uh, triggering for some people and if you're vulnerable to topics around sexual abuse, sexual violence, the rape of children, then please be mindful before you listen to this episode. We will talk to two survivors in this episode. We're going to touch on the racism and discrimination travellers faced being forced into these homes. We're going to talk about how the government took traveller children away from their parents because they deemed the traveller way of life to be cruel. And we're also going to talk to another guest who was born in a mother and baby home and then spent their whole life up until the age of 18 in other institutions. This is a very deep and dark episode, but it's definitely one that we have to have. We have to have this discussion. We have to hear these voices, and especially after this new bill that was signed into law. We need to repeal the seal. This show has been sponsored by The Furniture Emporium. The Furniture Emporium is located in Ormore, County Galway. Go check them out on Facebook, Twitter, and on their website. They do a lot of online sales also. Make sure you check out their Instagram for all the cool pictures they have of all the cool and funky furniture. Check out The Furniture Emporium, Ormore, County Galway. Broken homes, broken hearts, broken truths, they make for bad stars, shattered dreams, and broken minds, you can't bridge the distance between those broken lines. Those broken lines will undersize you, won't recognize you, they'll paralyze you. The distance between those broken lines, temperature changes, you're hot and you're cold. your value but your body and soul as soon as you're in you're told to go out broken lines is what I'm talking about those broken lines On a one-way track But you keep on moving Because you can't get back Makes no difference If you can read the signs When you can't bridge the distance Between those broken lines those broken lines undersize you, won't recognize you, paralyze you. The distance between those broken lines.
not how you play If it's on the cards You're always the joker Never the queen of hearts Always the loser And you can never win Those broken lines will always be a sin Those broken lines And the size you Won't recognize you They paralyze you The distance between those broken lines Can't bridge the distance between those broken lines between those broken lines So you just heard a song there by Trish Riley, uh, Irish traveller, singer, songwriter. And as will become apparent in this episode, she is also somebody who has come through the, uh, I suppose you could call it the institutions in Ireland, uh, more specifically I think I'm right in saying this, uh, Trish, that it's the mother and baby homes or is it the industrial school? So you can correct me on this in a second. But what I want to say firstly, for anyone that listens to that song, please listen to it very carefully again. Um, it's a very poignant song and one that uh, I suppose mixes well with the tone of this full episode. So first and foremost, welcome to the Has Been Show, Trish Riley. Thank you, Martin. I'm delighted to be on. Um, just in relation there to what you mentioned about it, was, was it the mother and baby homes or the institutions? At the time I was taken into care, which was in 1981, there was a kind of a transitional period where the institutions were closing and they were becoming group homes. So it was a little of both, you know. There would have been a lot of lay staff at this point, you know, when I was taken into care. Right, OK. So um, it's that was in 1980. 1981. 1981. Not too long ago, Trish. Not too long ago at all. Not really, no, no, not really. And it's... it's um, sorry, go on. Go on ahead. No, you go on ahead, yeah. <laughs> we're so polite to each other. No, you go, you go. No, I go. Okay, I know, so... Yeah. <laughs> the other day when we were chatting on the phone, Martin, when we weren't trying to do the, the interview... We were interrupting one another. Well, I'll tell you what it is, actually, and, and this will be true for, true to form for the rest of this episode. As I, I was, my, The next guest is coming on, Felix O'Neill. I said the exact same thing to him, and I said, I said to you as well, this is not about my voice at all, so I'm going to keep my participation in this full episode to a bare minimum. I'm going to ask the bare questions that will help me get a better understanding of, of, of the whole situation. Even my language that I use, like, but not knowing the difference between mother and baby home and uh, an industrial school or the, the, like those type of things, those institutions. Like this is, what I, this is what this episode is about. It's about me learning and shutting up for once and letting other people talk and speak their truth. So this is all about you, Trish. This is all about uh, Felix and this is all about the other survivors that came through that. So by all means, correct me because I don't know enough about this and most of the listeners won't know it either. So Please speak your truth, and you you put me in my place whenever I uh, don't get something correct. I will indeed. No okay. better woman. <laughs> <laughs> no better woman is right. No better bior. But let okay. So let's start off with um. So in 1981, you you how how did you end up in one of those institutions? Okay. Well, um, really, prior to 1981, my life consisted of travelling um, in a very traditional way, in, in the old traditional traveller style, which would have been to travel around nomadically in tents and, and various to different various camping places. Um, bearing in mind um, that those years would have been 20 years after, not even 20 years actually, after the 1963 report, which was a very... Um, uh, important document in relation to travellers, especially around forced assimilation practices. So the state would have been um, seeking out travellers, really, you know, um, and, you know, whether to evict them or move them on or ensure their children were attending school. And a lot of travellers were taken into care um, from that report. Um, 
So, no, if what happened was there would have been a lot of officials, a lot of travellers would, would remember this, a lot of official people calling out to different camps. And it wasn't someone from, social workers from the council, you know, it was then um, guards or various different people. And one particular person that we, we would have been familiar with would be the cruelty man, as he was called. Which is the song and, um, that you sang as well. That's it, yeah. And um, so, you no. Know, one day, um, four of my siblings, uh, sorry, four, including myself, were taken to a courthouse with my parents. And I had no idea why I was there or what even this environment was. I was never in, in, in a public building like that. And I clearly remember sitting there and then hearing that I'd be taken away. Now, I knew the words taken away because my father would have always told us not to talk to officials in case we got taken away. A lot of travellers would be familiar with that little phrase, you'll be taken. Yeah, taken. You know, yeah. yeah. And sorry, what age were you? So sorry, Trish, but what what age were you then when this happened? I was eight years of age when it actually happened, eight years old. So, you know, you can imagine by eight years yeah, of, of age, you have all your core memories, you know, and that those memories would be of your travelling life and your, your personality is almost nearly formed to a degree. So, you know, you've, 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 you already have your identity, you know. So when we went to the courtroom, um, literally we were, were hurled out by these officials and put into a minibus. And I really couldn't conceive of what was happening. I remember we were all crying and screaming and trying to get back out and they were trying to bribe us with sweets. And we were taken to another town um, up in Drogheda and um, it was then that we were, were taken into the home, you know. And I remember it was very strange. Not ju- Obviously it was traumatic to be taken away from your parents uh, in that fashion with no forewarning or anything like that. But it was very traumatic in that I'd never been in a house before. I'd never been in, in, in away from my family life because as far as I, the way I perceived the world was we were we were the right people, not the, you know, we were the, the, the community. I didn't understand anything outside of traveller life, if you know what I mean. So it was extremely strange. You know, we were all hurled up that evening to have baths one after the other. And I remember waking up the next morning and the fear, you know, and shouting, we're taken, we're taken, you know, and... It was it was a shock, and it was it, it all happened so suddenly, you know. And as the days and weeks moved on, um, my parents by this time had come and camped up right outside the school that we were going to be attending. And um, as the days and, and weeks moved on, I realised I wasn't going home. Okay. You know, yeah. I realised at that point I wasn't I wasn't going home. And from there on in, then it was about you know gradually having to, to, to um, be subjected to the, the extreme assimilationist practices of, of the care homes and, and, and the people in there, you know. And so you, you, so you spent 10 years there, so you were 18, literally well, an adult there, is it? Yeah, um, well, what happened was we, we initially stayed together. They allowed the, the children, to, the four girls, to stay together, but then they separated us all. They put two of my older sisters up into um, with the nuns up in Dublin and they they had their own experience of, of a lot of abuse up there and, and that's one of the, the institutions that would have been named in the residence, res, residential excuse me um, institutions redress board as one of the institutions that would have been um, very abusive uh, to, towards children, and yeah. um, so I was left w- with my young, my two younger sisters, and then they sent us to a third home. They sent us to a second home, rather, and in that one, then there was just the three of us, and there we would have experienced very, very acute racism. And that it was like the wing of a hospital. It wasn't actually a house or anything. It was very well known as the orphanage, even mm. though we weren't orphans. We would have been known as the children from the orphanage you know, in that home. So that's how people in the town would have seen us, you know. And um, then I, again, from there, then I moved down to, uh, to another home when I was 15 to the Westmead area. So there were three different institutions that I would have been in, you know. Yeah. All of them would have been in the Ryan report, you know. So, yeah, 10 years in total. See, the, this is like, and, and and when you mentioned about the cruelty man, so it was basically, <clears throat> and just a recap, so I have it in my own head, 
the cruelty man was somebody almost like a truancy officer now for people with school yeah. and things like that, but to the extreme That's where right. you were taken away from your family. And then was there yeah. any was there any legal recourse or support for the family to um, I suppose work towards oh, getting no. their kids no, back? No, 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 none whatsoever. I mean, I mean to be honest, at that time my family were very poor. But a lot of people were, you know what I mean? The majority of people, it wasn't, you know, you know, um, we would have been on social welfare, but a lot of people would have been, you know what I mean? But um, that that wouldn't be a valid reason for, for any family to be uprooted, you know? Uh, they apologised in years to come. I rang up about it, you know, and I asked why, you know, and said, well, if it was today, that wouldn't happen. But the Jurvik is a public apology. I can tell you that it does still happen, you know, it does still happen, you know, with travellers in particular, you know. Some of the stories, Trish, I would have heard would have been, and it ties into exactly what you're saying there, the fear of the cruelty man, fear of being taken. And a lot of our our contemporary lingo, like the word taken and all that, comes from that type of thing. It does indeed, yeah. And I suppose one of the questions then, like, because this has come up in the past, it's where, you know, it was seen to be like the cruelty man was felt justified rather in taking these kids away yourself and your sisters are taken away from their parents because they deemed life on the road to be cruel and to be less than human and to be dehumanizing and this is what they tried to say was the justification for splitting up families and basically stealing kids from their parents evident that that's what they thought you know they wouldn't publicly admit that martin you know what i mean but um it was evident i mean it, it, it does all link into to the whole um education act at the time and the 1963 report giving the state giving by by brand saying that you know they were going to get rid of the itinerant problem you know at the time they, they referred to it as itinerant um, and even in documentation that i would have got um through freedom of information later would have referred to us as the itinerant, you know, um, the, the Riley itinerant family. And, um, you know, so their uh, whole take on this was that, you know, travellers were, were, um, uh, we were, we were a threat really to, to Ireland in terms of how we, we came across in, um, in, an, in an economic sense. I mean, this is the time where, you know, they, they just, they were ashamed of travellers. They wanted to get rid of travellers, you know what I mean, completely and assimilate us, not just into institutions, but in every way, you know, into houses and uh, in, in absolutely many different ways, to, you know, to get rid of travellers, you know what I mean? And, um, so, you know, that was done through any means um, necessary. And one of the, the ways that they could take traveller children was by saying to the traveller family, you need to have your children in school under the Education Act. Now, you can imagine, from my parents' point of view, we're camped, we'll say, down around Cavan, for, for example, in a particular area there. Mm. And you've social workers calling out and they're saying, you know, Mr. Riley, you must send your children to school. And to be fair to him, he tried very hard to do that. He wanted us to go to school, actually. So he would put us into different schools. We went to a huge amount of different schools because of the amount of movement we had to do. And so he would put us into school and comply there, you know. But then you would have, you know, within days, the guards coming out and saying that people were complaining because we were camped there and we would have, you know, you have to move. Yes, yeah, so you're forced on. And, you know, so... He has to pack up everything and move to the next spot, wherever he could get get going. I remember we didn't have transport at the time, and you'd have to go and panic trying to find somebody to give you a lift to the next place and pack up everything. And again, you'd get to the next place, and then you'd have a social worker or officials calling out again, telling you to enroll your children in school. You might get away with a, a week or two, three weeks in another school. You could be in Monaghan at this time, and then. Again, you'd have the guards coming out that the residents were complaining or the townspeople were complaining that you were camped there. So it was a catch-22 situation. So you were you were damned if you did and you were damned if you didn't. Do you know what I mean? So and and that, that, that's... That, so, so basically, you're expected to put your kids into school. Fair enough. Valid point. But how do you do... Like this, And as you just mentioned it. It's like, how the hell do you do that if you haven't even got a place to live? If you're living in an area... And then you're being forced on because of these racist people and these people just didn't want travellers around 
and then the guards come along and do their bidding, move you on, and then the next day you have counsel and you have social workers and you yes. have the cruelty man. So no matter what you try to do, even in, when your intention is to get your kid into school, they didn't care because at the end of the day, one of the most basic things and most one of the most basic principles around the security of a family is a place to live. And if you haven't got that, yes. obviously the priority is not going to be getting your kids into school, it's going to be making sure that your kids can sleep and wake up safely. Exactly, and bearing in mind as well around the education that, you know, travellers have their own idea um, that fits within their culture, would have had at the time, around education, that education was more like a lifetime time experience, life experiences for what you might, would be relevant, to, we'll say, for example, to your community. So, for example, there would have been a lot of apprenticeships in the traveller community. So if your father was a tinsmith, you, you'd go into tinsmith if you were, you know, the lads would go into that. If you, when we had our own traveller economy running, which we did have before the 1963 report and before the introduction of social welfare. So there wasn't actually... So much emphasis put on education in the in the in, in the way that most people see education, but there was a lot of education that was relevant to us. You Absolutely, know, and I 100%. often think of, of even <clears throat> it was the horse care school. as well. I even think, look, when I, when I think of my own kids in terms of education, I look at Steiner schools and Montessori schools and I look at how they try to put practicality into that. And we had the Minister for Education there recently when the whole scandal came out about how the Leaving Search. Um, was managed and some students who would have liked to get into third level uh, education in the general population he, he put huge emphasis on you know oh now we need to start looking at people being, being, being looking at uh, getting apprenticeships and stuff and that is how it was in our community if you went to horse dealing that's what you did you know what I mean so uh, you have to look uh, compare like with like you know what I mean and, and look at it in that context because but when we did get to the point of where we knew, look, we do have to now, by law, you know what I mean, send children to school. Travellers found it very, very difficult to get to stay in a school. And your only option was to move into a halting site. And, you know, today, travellers would like living, some of them may like living in halting sites if, they're, if they are consulted about how those halting sites are managed. And if they're with families, that they can get along with. But in fact, then these were halting sites that had tigines in them. And we did move into a tigine one, one time. That was basically like a prefab. Like a and small house. You, yeah, I wouldn't even call it a house, Martin, to be honest with you. They were ridiculous looking, do you know what I mean? There were these oh, I, I'm thinking the that more of the word chig. To, uh, yeah, yeah, it chig. was the safe way of training us for moving into houses. Do you know, oh, do you know I'm sure what I'm actually I'm happy you brought that up actually not happy that, that it happened but this is yeah. something that I was told by my own parents okay yeah. that when they were like when they got their first council house that the council workers came out to train them to live in a house yeah. And that, that, that was exactly. a commonplace practice with county councils across the country that if a traveller family wanted to move into a council house they first had to get training and they had to be more or less house trained before, before they were given yes, the house. Like we were animals. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That was exactly it, you know what I mean? Um, they did away with them in the end, but the sites had no facilities in them. Um, we be, would have been used to not having facilities anyway, do you know what I mean? But the point is, you know, you were thrown in, and this is where they complained then about travellers, maybe if, if you didn't get on with a particular family. Now, you would get that in all aspects of society, but it's a very confined space. They were like concentration camps back then. And I don't mean to offend any travellers that like living in them today because this is a different time. But back then, it was packed them all in there, you know, and there'd be chicken wire around this and you'd have a couple of um, little spaces to go into, but it was any travellers they could find, get them off the road and pack them in here. And that was the way they did it. Well, that, that was you the process I mean? of the forced assimilation. And and I suppose Absolutely. whenever I talk about assimilation, I always try to show that and to draw the comparisons. It's not integration. Integration is oh, where no. you say, I accept your way of life and this is my way of life. We're going to integrate both of us together and we're going to try and work harmoniously and live harmoniously together. Assimilation yeah. is saying, I don't care about your traditions or your culture. You are now being forced to live the way that I see fit and that is more palatable to the majority. We do not take that on... That is exactly do, do you know? it, Martin. You've hit the nail on the head. Integration, if it's not been misused as a word to replace assimilation, 
which some people do, you know, they'll tell you it's integration, but it's, it's still forced assimilation, you know. Yes. But integration is where you accept the person's cultural identity. You don't infringe upon that and you integrate them as in you are inclusive of them, but not expecting that the conditions are that you change who you are. You yes, know? It's, it's basically um, uh, acceptance, not just tolerance, and it's equality, but it's not equality based on your performances. So you don't have no. to jump through hoops before we treat you like a human. That's proper yeah, integration. There shouldn't have to be a price to pay to be, for travellers to be included. Travellers should be included even today. In, in, in all different areas of life but that doesn't have to come at a price and unfortunately they say to us you can be included provided you're like us provided that you, you, you live your life accordance with what we call the social norms of society or it's like it's like I suppose it's like me in the media we'll give you all the interviews going but it's only on the basis that you'll answer for the crimes or the ills or the issues facing yeah, your community so you're saying from their hymn sheet precisely <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely yeah that's it well going, going back you then know. going if you don't mind discussing it a little bit more um, but what was the daily grind like what was it like the daily processes involved in living in a care home or, or an institution like that well, in the very early stages, it was, it, was, it was dreadful because, I mean, you know yourself and most travellers would know, we don't, we don't think the same in terms of clock time. We don't think the same in terms of, of being rigid. We're, not, we're very flexible and adaptable people and we live in the moment. Yes. We always do live in the moment. But, you know, that's the way we, we, we are. And um, we wouldn't have the same. We'd have our own social norms, which are perfectly suitable for our community and had our own social norms. So what we consider to be the right way to live would be the complete, completely alien to the settled community at that time. And then, you know, so just even adapting to how the settled community perceived things was a big shock to me, you know. So this thing of, you know, um, not being able to speak the way I spoke, like I would have been a fluent cant speaker, you know what I mean? My family were and, 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 and still are, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was wrong. You know, that was laughed upon. That was like, you know, you can't, you can't speak like that. So you, mu- you must speak like this. And they would sit you down and they would say to you, you know, uh, they make us recite, you know, certain things to get our diction proper. You know what I mean? Like, so they'd say, set the table to the chair. You could hardly be aware. And this is a poem you'd have to learn, you know. Then you'd have to sit at the ta- all around the table and you'd have to use certain cutlery. Now, you know, I was a, a child that drank out of a jamjar, and quite happily, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean, know. Or a You know, my father was a tinsmith himself. Yeah. And, um, you know, we didn't have these pretentious social graces. You know, it was to this, and, um, it was it was to make you more settled, and they still do that oh, to some absolutely. extent today. You know, yes, absolutely. And it's the white I mean, the whitewashing of the language. Those times, even certain people those times wouldn't even have had to go to those extremes. You know. The settle people, pe- listen, Trish, you know, the settle people I know today that wouldn't know the difference between a fork and a knife, right? You know, but, course, there's, yeah. but there's no expectation on them or they're not put into an industrial school. They're not forced to learn the yeah. ways of somebody else. Isn't it an awful indictment on Irish society when you have people stealing kids from their parents because they deem their parents to be bad parents based on their perspective of their way of life? And not Absolutely. only their way of life, their yeah. way of survival. And that was from Lynchia. Like, I mean... They, they would say to me, I remember my father, you know, got straight up, like, and he came to visit as quickly as he could. He never stopped trying to get visits, nor my mother. But um, when they'd come up to, to the home, they, they'd go into a particular room that they had, you know, to, to visit. Now, I have to say, and, 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 and I must say this, there was one particular nun. She wouldn't come in that often. And she was actually very, very good. And even, you know, I've seen a lot of people that are talking about the nuns and the priests, and, and, and I don't doubt what they're saying. But this particular nun was very, very, in the beginning, very, very accommodating of my family and, and used to love them, you know, love my parents. But she didn't stay too long. And, of course, then there was different shifts that people did in the home. So you didn't have the consistency of, of her being there. But it turned out that there was another lady there, and she used to say, when they came up to visit, you know, she'd send you into the room with the debt of, 
and tell you to open the window and clean out the room after the visit. So they try to instill shame in you yeah. about who you were and who your parents were. And, um, you know, if we were all excited after a visit, we were all told fairly rapidly to, to, to calm down and, and stay quiet and that my father was nothing but a tinker. And that was told over and over and over and over again, you know, that your parents were... were, were um, were completely just defective, you know, and um, they tried very hard to instill a sense of shame and to get you, and they would actually say to you, you should be grateful for the clothes you have on you. You should be grateful for the food you have. And, you know, I think they wanted to feel they rescued you. And a lot of settled people to this day think that they are rescuing travellers. You know, it's a it's a well documented way of living. You know that type of thing. Yep, absolutely, it's a well documented. Actually, it's theorised a lot throughout yeah. uh, psychology and sociology that uh, savior complex, and that happens. Oh, yes, it happens quite yes. regularly because what, what, when some and it's it's almost an instinctual subconscious uh, trait of somebody who is privileged because they don't they don't they can't name or view themselves as having privilege. So it it manifests in, in a certain way where they think they're doing good. And they're helping yes. out, but in actual fact, yes. what they're doing is and is is portraying the, their their I suppose hierarchical stance or wh- where they're sitting within the hierarchy yeah. or how they're yeah. stratified and you know socially and how powerful they are, and they don't even know they're doing it. You know, it's like oh, I'm trying to help out. You know, I'm really trying, but you should, yeah. like you should be grateful they, that they I'm trying. Trying to fix travellers because they cannot conceive of the fact that travellers prior to the 1963 report. Even given the poverty and all that was in Ireland at the time for absolutely everybody. But, you know, they cannot conceive of that we didn't see ourselves that way. That, that we, we, we were okay, you know, until they started interfering. Do you know what I mean? So what they saw as, you know, defective, we saw as very functional. So, oh. yeah, you know what I mean? It was, it was a case of imposing and doing it through force and through punishment and ridicule. You know what I mean? And abuse, emotional abuse and, and mental torture, really. Do you know what I mean? It was a, through doing, doing it in, in that manner. I mean, everybody had their own individual way of how they dealt with things. But the general institutional thinking, and, you know, even even individuals who were there, because they came and went, there was, was hundreds of staff that came in, in my time. There was no one consistent person. But, you know, it was that institutional thinking coming from the 1963 report that, you know, our job is to assimilate you because, of course, then we didn't have ethnicity recognition or anything or any cultural acceptance, you know. Yeah. You know, we were just a, a, a burden on society in, in their eyes. So, you know, you know, these traveller children that they saw, you know what I mean? Their job was to get the traveller out of you. And to some extent, that still exists. And, you know, that whole thing oh, about does. viewing us as a broken thing. <laughs> you know, I always yeah. say the same thing. We're not broken. And we certainly no. will fix ourselves if you guys stop chipping away at us, you know, because yeah. that's what it comes yeah. down to. Like, we, if we weren't oppressed, we wouldn't be broken, you know. Well, this is it. And this is the thing. And th- th- this is the thing is, 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 is that they broke the traffic community. I mean, if you look at, at the 1963 report, it actually says that Travers health was way way, was was brilliant. The children's health was brilliant at the time before they, they interfered. Do you know what I mean? But now we have a big mental health crisis. Now we have young travellers, as you know yourself, which is very sad in the younger generation, who are assimilated into society in such a way that they, they have taken on social problems that were never in our community, like the drug problem, for example. That was never a thing in our community. So now they have actually brainwashed travellers into believing you know, that these problems, that socioeconomic problems that we have now were always there. Yeah. But they weren't always there. They were, it was as a, it was a consequence and a, a result of that assimilation it's, that, uh, that has given us these problems, you know. So we didn't have the, uh, the mental health crisis we had and we didn't have these issues. So, you know, these are, are, are um, the repercussions of that. Yeah, you and I, I read somewhere after the 1950s when the Social Welfare Act came in that travellers were forced into more or less ghettoised areas in order to get the social welfare. Um, they, they, they have Another tracking system, absolutely, Martin. Yeah, that was, yeah, the social welfare was the, the, the ruination of us because prior to that, travel, I, I, you know, the travel economy w- w- was, was thriving 
around the time prior to the 50s anyway do you know what I mean you know yourself the, the tinsmithing and, and the travellers that worked on farms or whatever um, scrap collecting all of that but when the social welfare came in th- that that forced us to, to have to settle in one town in order to get your payment that's right because you, know you know had to have a fixed abode I actually have a joke about that about having a fixed yeah. abode um, because that was that, that actually cut stems the joke that I have is um, you know I went I went to the doll office and you know they ask me my name and I give my name and then they ask me have you any fixed abode and my re- my response is always I fixed a van but I've never fixed a fucking boat oh, because we that. didn't know what a fixed abode was yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah we didn't but and and that was brilliant you look at the way people are today everybody is having to travel here there and everywhere for work that's how we were. Work and nomadism went hand in hand. Well, we were an you integral know. part to the, the, I suppose, the agricultural industry as well. We were a, a, yeah. a lot of us were farm hands. A lot of us uh, would have mended the the metal and the tin that was on. Now, obviously, with the introduction of plastic in the sixties, um, it done yeah. away with a lot of the plastic or the 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 tin smithing on the farms, and there was less of a need, and plastic was becoming uh, Which more. Is fair enough this happens this happens in society that's fair enough and it's not that we're expecting people are still to come to us and ask us for that you know what I mean or that trade or those things but we had other things going on as well you know what I mean absolutely there was, you know so many other things you know that, that, that travellers did I suppose the point of the matter really is you know what I mean is that of course it's going to be an involvement in our culture but it's about the fact that this was forced do you know, to annihilate yeah. a community. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was uh, We don't have a problem with, with people not uh, wanting us, you know, or, or that plastic came in. You know, these things do happen. Yeah. But it was the fact that, you know, um, they, they, they tried so hard, you know what I mean? Yeah. To, 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 um, to subject us, you know what I mean, to, to treatment that, that you, wouldn't, you wouldn't put on an animal. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like the violence in the evictions, for example. Evictions that would, that only happen because of their, their policy. I mean, they criminalise us by the different policies they put in place. Yeah. Do you know? And the anti trespassing so, I mean, laws. Like, look, to be honest with you, at every step throughout the history of the, the Irish state, they've tried to stop our way of life. And to the yeah. point that we're in, in this day and age now, where we're at the end, we're seeing the end result of... Uh, like a, a century of 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 different types of oppression, and the centuries before that, because there's also there's also things in the archive where it was once, excuse me, seen as illegal to um, even be seen speaking to a traveller, vagrant or gypsy. Like this is in this is in the the archives. You know, this there's a long yes, history yeah. of it, uh, where there was seen to be repercussions for settled people to be dealing with travellers. And if if people today, contemporary minded people today, don't see the link between that type of rhetoric and today's mentality, then they need to do a little bit yeah. more research. Well, I think that was, prior to 1963 report, I think you're spot on there. there, there of course, there was an element of that, but I, I think um, there was a class system, as you know yourself. So, I mean, that was more to do with the class system, I think, myself, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I think the 1963 report basically gave permission to settle people. Of course, it was all settled people that were consulted in the itinerary report questionnaire and yeah. that. So, you know, it um, it gave them permission to justify and continue from there on in yeah. to, 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 uh, to um, treat travellers the way that they have done, you know? Well, Trish, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and have you on the podcast. It's been eye-opening and somewhat saddening to hear of the history of, 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 of your life and what you've had to overcome. But I do want to say this to you. You're a hero of mine and you're an absolute inspiration, especially when we talk about overcoming adversity and things like that. You've overcome so much and you're so articulate and well put together right now that you you, you have an, a vast knowledge around this. And I think your voice needs to be heard a lot more. Um, but for my part, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on my podcast. Um, 
and uh, look, you're going to be coming on for a broader discussion, by the way, soon about uh, travellers in the arts and travellers in music. So like, I, I do want to bring you back on for that as well. Yes, and I'd like to get an old, a bit of time as well with Marianne for the crack. <laughs> Marianne is a very full schedule. Exactly, leave Marianne out of this. <laughs> yeah, um, Martin, it's my pleasure to talk to you and I'm delighted that you've ha- had me on and I'm really looking forward to your next guest uh, on, on the podcast. And, and you know on that note we're going to we're going to segue into that but we're going to play you out with one of your other songs the name of the second song it was a cover of a John Lennon song do you want to tell us a little bit about it before we play it yeah John Lennon's song um, Working Class Hero no there's just a few lyrics in the song um, that, that I particularly like you know what I mean um, about you know that, that it reminds me now of what's going on with, with, with people who grew up in institutions you know what I mean how, how the abuse that they had to suffer and then they're expected, one of the lines in it is they then expect you to go out and pick a career, you know, and but but you can't function because you're so full of fear and all of those challenges that you have to overcome. So that particular song, I have my own meaning as to what it means, do you know what I mean? Um, so I, 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 I really like it. Okay. And I love John Lennon anyway, you know what I mean? He was a great activist, you know? Yeah. Well, look, peacekeeper. on that note, we're going to play out your segment with your cover of that song, uh, Trish Riley, thank you so much for joining me. Cheers, Martin. Thanks, a million. Take right, care. Take care. Well, as soon as you're born, it make you feel small. By giving you no time instead of it all. Till the pain gets so big.
up next on the Has Been Show, and for this episode, we're talking to Felix O'Neill, who was born in an industrial school, a mother and baby home, I'm going to say, but I'm going to be corrected about that in a second, no doubt. And he, he spent 18 years there, so you're very welcome. And listen, thank you so much, by the way, for taking the time and for, for um, giving me the opportunity to have this discussion with you on this platform. Uh, you're very welcome to the Has Been Show, Felix. Thank you very much, Martin. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I was in, I was born in a mother baby home, St. Patrick's on the Navan Road in 1954. And I spent the next 18 years of my life in and out of different uh, religious institutions, industrial schools, orphanages, etc. Okay. Uh, so the, the guest that I had on just before um, you, Felix, was Trish Riley. Um, who, who speaks highly of you, by the way. She's started to read uh, some of your stuff. And one of the things that stood out for Trish, which when I was talking to her, uh, she was saying that how delighted she was that you put words to an experience that she had. And it was around the discrimination and racism that was promoted by um, officials and people with power within these institutions. And she said that for years, nobody would believe her that she was treated badly because she was a traveller. Um, so, like, I suppose this is how I, I, I came across you myself as a recent article you wrote where you're talking about your friend Patsy. I'd love for you to just discuss that a little bit more, actually. Well, yes. Well, um, when I was nine years of age, um, believe it or not, I was sent to an industrial school down in Tralee, down in Kerry. And I was a young child coming out of... Um, uh, another school, which was um, St. Philomena's Homes to Logan, which is an orphanage. I was five years there, and prior to that, four years in a mother and baby home. Four years in a mother and baby home. Anyway, I obviously, I was born in Dublin, and I end up down in the industrial school, St. Joseph's Industrial School in Tralee, in County Kerry. And um, most kids were aged from about nine till, I guess, 16. And um, you you just get on with life. But, um, you know, a, a nine-year-old that I was, I, I made a few friends. I, I didn't ask them what religion they were. I didn't ask them what colour they were. It didn't bother me in the slightest. And um, one who became a particular friend of mine, his name was Patsy. We almost went in at the same time together into this place. And we, we just hit it off. Maybe it was his sense of humour or my sense of humour or God knows what. Anyway, um, I was... You know, I was, um, we became good friends and I was playing in the yard with him and some of the boys and we we're just horsing around, you know what I mean, the kids do, playing cowboys or whatever. And one of their cool brothers in the yard, who was patrolling, uh, gave me a clout. I thought he was going to slap me, in, in, in other words, because uh, he, he called me over uh, uh, to him. So I went across the yard to him and he asked me to walk around the yard with him. He wanted to speak to me and I'm thinking, okay. And I was very, you know, I was really fearful because this brother had a, a reputation as being um, a hard man, hit, lashing out the children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He was known for that. Right. Anyway, so I cautiously approached him and very cautiously walked around with him. And he said to me, that boy you're playing with, and I said, what boy? He said, that boy you were playing with. Who's, who he said, do you know who he is? And I said, yes, it's Patsy. And he said, no, he's not Patsy. He's a tinker. He's a tramp. He's a gypsy. He's whatever. And I was like, I never heard these words. I didn't mean a thing to me. And I'm like, what? And uh, I don't understand. Uh, he's, a, he's my friend. He said, no, 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 no. He's um, a tinker, but the word that was used, knacker. And I could go through a whole lot of other words, which I really don't want to do so. Yeah. And he said, and that boy over there is one, and that boy. And I looked around, and all I saw was a boy with red hair, a boy, tall boy or fat boy with, you know, with, with black hair or brown hair, blonde hair. I didn't see any distinction, but I don't see anything different. He had two legs like I do. He's got a head like me, maybe good or bad, but it didn't matter. I didn't see the thing. And, and he looked at me, and he says, did you know this? And I said, I don't know what it means. And I asked him what, what a tinker was. And, of course, he roared at me and you know i thought he was going to reach over to me and slap me and i kind of pulled back from him and then um, i was done with the encounter of course i left him very quickly and i ran back he, or, well he dismissed me and i went back to patsy 
Pats me after me what he said, and I said, Patsy said you were a tinker, because Pitsy and I didn't know what a tinker was, Patsy didn't know what a tinker was, and Patsy laughed, and because he laughed, I laughed, and then he called me tinker, I called him tinker, we danced around the yard, we played around the yard, it never bothered me what he was, he was Patsy, and that's to me was this, he was the same as me, same age, no problem whatsoever, we had ups and downs, hey, who has it, we're kids. Yes, absolutely, and of course racism and discrimination like that, that's not something that you're innately born with, it's some, it's a learned behaviour. So here you have this adult, this big hairy horrible man, trying yes. to skewer the perception of a child so early on, and that child happens to be really good friends, and, and by all accounts, Patsy was... It was probably a symbiotic relationship of support between the two of you. So it was very, one... very much so because we 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 kind of fought together against others. You know, he'd get a beating, I get a beat, I support him. But something I I discovered that really now when I reflect on it, he he was signaled out. Not just him, but this group of people that these brothers called tinkers and tramps and all that. I, I'm not being derogatory and using this no, term. Please, I, no, please, no, no, no. Speak your truth. Speak and, your truth. And and and. and but they seem to be more, I mean, I got my fair share of beatings and everything else. But for some reason or other, there was an inbuilt hatred to marginalize this particular group within our group. We were already uh, marginalized. But because it's a traveler or he was a tinker or whatever, they were taken out for more punishment. And they were, I mean, Patsy, my God, I used to just drag him away from, from the brothers who would just beat him for no reason. In fact, they just wanted to do it. And it wasn't a beating, it was humiliation. It was it was further than beating. It, it was to humiliate him. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. When I reflect on it now, it, it was criminal. It was unbelievable, the hatred. And for what? I mean, what was wrong? Okay, Patsy had black hair. I had brown hair, very little of it. But Jesus Christ, I didn't see anything different. In Patsy, he spoke with a, a culture actor. Jesus, I was from Dublin. I mean, I was called the Jackie. It didn't bother me in the slightest. I didn't see anything else was different Patsy and I. We... We shared everything together as friends, you know, clothing, what, whatever. Bar soap, a towel between us, a toothbrush. But it was Patsy. It didn't. I didn't see anything there. I didn't see anything wrong. We had two coloured people in the yard, and they were very popular. There was no issue with them, but they were beaten as well. But no one was beaten as bad as the travellers. That's something I learned much later. So, so I, I bonded with him. I bonded with him, and his fights were my fights. My fights were his fights, and and we're fine. And and and, and that was life then. Now I realize much, much, much later on the cruelty that went on. Incidentally, uh, sadly, Patsy, five years after he was released from this dump, committed suicide. I mean, I'm not surprised. It was dreadful. It, I mean, the treatment he got in there was appalling. But he was one of many of my class, as I said, of 46 people, 44 died within five years of the release from this place. 44 out of 46? That. It's an incredible number. Sorry, that was 44 out of 46? Yes, in my class. That is harrowing. And you know, and you've touched on something there. So when, when Patsy would have left, or, or, or released rather, because he was caged like you were, when, 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 when that happened, what age was he when, when he finally got out? Patsy, Patsy was about 16. But, I mean, when you left these places, you know, the industrial schools, it, there was no halfway house. You, you were just put out. You, Patsy would have no experiences. I didn't have any experience with money. Incidentally, I ran away. From, I ran away from there. And um, I wanted Patsy to come with me. But, I mean, I ran away from there. But, I, I mean, we had no experience. We didn't even know what money was. We, we didn't know you had to buy stuff. We didn't know that you, a loaf of bread you had to buy. And I've no doubt Patsy was at a disadvantage because what they painted him as. I mean, he, he, I mean, it wasn't as if he was from the planet Mars, but he might as well have been from the planet Mars yeah. because his life when he went out inside was terrible. It must have been horrendous when, when, when he got out. I mean, one, he had no place to go. He had no family to go to. And he was, I mean, the same with any of the kids. But for the particular group within our group, we were all marginalized. There was something about how they treated the traveling children. You could see it. It was just, it was worse than cruelty because they, it, it was morning, noon, and night. It, it was extraordinary. I, I'm surprised um, any of them uh, survived. I, I, that sounds a terrible thing to say, but my God. I, I mean, I'm not surprised when I learned much later on what happened to Patsy. I'm not surprised. I know some other travellers are in there, and, and they've ended up, in sadly, in, 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 in special hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, mental breakdowns. I'm not surprised. Many turned to alcoholics, many turned to drink, uh, many turned to self-abuse. Um, and, and of course, they were real treated if they went into, of course, what's called the lunatic asylums. 
again, a derogatory term, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. And many of them went there and were destroyed within. They were illegally operated on. They were trashed. They were beaten. I mean, I mean, pe- people talk about what, what went down in Nazi Germany. I can assure you what went on to some of these institutions was worse than anything went on at these places. Uh, you're, you're talking about children now. You're talking about children, vulnerable children. Many children, many, many, many children, myself included, were raped morning, noon, and night. Not just beaten. We were physically raped. And this is a fact. And you could, the Ryan report talk about uh, the, the, the nice word people use is abuse. It's a lovely word, abuse. Yes, I was abused. I was slapped on the head. That's abuse. But I was physically raped, as was Patsy, as were many others, just for the simple reason that a brother could do it, just for the simple reason of power that he could do it. Yeah. But but his five minutes of what he did destroyed my life and every other survivor's life to come out of there. And remember this, that every single child, practically every child in these institutions, believe it or not, were raped. And yes. the first thing about, uh, if you go on to the, the report that was done, the, the, the Ryan report, Mr. Justice Ryan's report, he talks about rape. He said it was very difficult to get the, the, the men who were children at the time to talk about physically what happened to them. Most people would never use the word of rape. Most men would never use the word rape. Yeah, because it was but a shame, it was, a shame it was associated, when, wasn't it? Yes, it was worse than the shame. And I struggled with this for 60 years. I struggled to use that word. 60 years. When I went to the Ryan Report, they actually found me in London. And I'm in the Ryan Report. A brother raped me in the morning and tried to drown me in the afternoon. To drown me in the afternoon. Patsy came and pulled me out of the water. They, 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 they lumped this brother with stones till they dragged me out of the water. I was naked in the water. This animal who had raped me in the morning was now trying to kill me. Fuck, and it's, and, and it's that's disgusting. in the Ryan. That's in the Ryan. That's in the Ryan report. That is in the Ryan report. And when Mr. Justice Ryan found me, and they had to get permission of British government to have the session, the Ryan report sit in London. I went there. The United Nations lawyer represented me, and I got up and. The prosecutor on the other side, uh, the legal person got up and says, oh, Felix, you don't do anything. We accept all. I said, no. I said, I'm going to speak. And he kept interrupting. The judge said to him, to the other man, he said, would you sit down and let Felix talk at his own time? So he sat down and I got up. And it took me 10 minutes before I could say to Mr. Ryan, what happened to me? And I said, I want to tell you something. I was raped. Yeah. And I wanted them to distinguish the difference between abuse and rape. You're talking about the rape of children. This is the most heinous crime you could commit on a child. And particularly someone who professes to be a religious person. To take a child, when you marginalize a group of people, whether it be travelers or myself or orphans or whatever it is, it then allows you to commit the most wickedness on these children. And that's what they did in every institution. That's why you have that mess that, that's up there in, in Tuam. That's why you have the septic tank with 800 children. What religion, I ask you, what religion in the world allows you to flush or put in 800 children into a septic tank? And what, what religion, is, what God do, allows you that? And a, and a further question, Felix, what fucking society allows it to happen and continue to happen yes. and tries to hide it? And try to hide with the record. Imagine them trying to seal the record. Imagine the scam. Imagine at midnight. And not at midnight, sorry. Let's be precise about this. The President of Ireland on a bank holiday weekend at, at 4 to 11 at night signs this, 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 whatever you want to call it, this law, hiding the records of the actions of a group of animals and criminals passing off as religious people that ran these institutions. We, we, we're six years, six years with two of them, six years. Yep. The children are still in the septic tank. I'll put it this way to you. There are 82 or 84 McDonald's in Ireland. Could you imagine them discovering in a septic tank, one child's body in a septic tank? What would you think would happen? Well, it's I'll bye bye McDonald's. Would they would burn every single McDonald's to the ground and every employee would be DNA'd and checked find out who the family or the father was of this child. And yet, in the west of Ireland, in the west of Ireland, in one institution, we have about 800 babies. The oldest child was seven years of age. What are they doing in the septic tank? You can't gloss that. You can't spin that. That's 800 in the septic tank, flushed in, packed in, sardine. It doesn't matter. 
why would you, the, the worst humiliation, not only are the children have died and you, you've discarded them, you've treated them worse than shit. Yes. Right? Yeah. You put them into a Victorian septic tank. That's more than contempt. When the cemetery was literally two minutes from that convent. It is, it is outrageous. And then you don't tell the mothers. Then you tell the mothers the child died or the child is adopted. Tomb sold 1,000 other babies for profit at 1,000 Irish pounds at a time each. And sent them off and, abroad. And they did. I remember that Galway Cathedral was built on the bones and the dead and starvations of children in tomb because the bishop stole the orphan funds that were given to feed those babies. And because of that, Two to three hundred children died of starvation because um, that, that that Bishop Noel Brown wanted to build his cathedral. And then the, the townspeople of Tomb had to go with him and threaten him to replace the money that he had stolen. In the meantime, 200 more children died. And this is what this is what we need to separate with. This is not about religion. This is not about religion. This is about a group of fanatical lunatics that hijacked religion for their own ends. They put themselves on a religious call around them, called themselves religious, and then got away with murder. And, and, and what's worse is that it continues to go uh, unchallenged by the state. This is what sparked it for me. Well, after I read your article the other day, it struck a chord with me. It's something that I haven't spoken about because it's not my place, but I had to speak out about it in some way, shape or form, because uh, that when, when we talk about the tomb uh, babies, that's that, that little tiny little area with the cross on the gate and the corner and it's where it's all yes where, where that's the, what i wrote yeah and where they are there's a little playground there that we played on i'm from tomb and i i live maybe 500 meters away from where that happened and you're dead right felix in what you said you said there that to put them into the septic tank and the, the cemetery is very close by the cemetery the main cemetery of tomb is about a hundred meters away that's right that's right. And you know what's more shocking? Do you know the playground you're playing on? Yes. They have found two more chambers there unaccounted for, right? There's 20 chambers in the, the main tank, which I've graphically described on my site. There were two, if not four more um, uh, enclosures outside it, right? There was another probably 1,800 to 2,000 other bodies outside. And by the way, the passage that led to, to underneath ground connected the church that used to be there underneath a collected septic tank, which means that they planned and they opened up the side of this place, right? Because you can't open the septic tank. Remember, it will weigh two or three hundred tons. So there's no way to lift the lid up. A, lay, a woman, a servant, um, probably a, a mother, uh, beaten, browbeaten by the nuns, would take the child down and stack it like lumps of meat if the child was not flushed into the toilet. At the beginning, the babies were just flushed down the loo. Then later on, they stopped that practice when it was when all the, the plumbing was, was connected up or the surge was connected up to the town, the town surge system. And then they bypassed the regular thing, but they kept the septic tank, which means it was still full of all the of human waste that was there. It dried out in time. Then they went in, built shelves. Then they put the, the like slabs of meat they put the children wrapped up in, in papers, brown paper, newspapers, old cloth, and stacked them up, stacked them up. The idea of that is shocking when you think that's why they don't open that. And that children's playground, I can assure you, you're going to find another 1,800, not 2,000 women and children there. And that's a fact. And the corridor all Disgusting. the way up. That, that woman who took those children out said she couldn't go no further. She then used to stack them down the, down the passageway before you came into the tank. She went underground to do, to, to do that. They built a passage. And, and, and it's so sick. Did you, do you know, by the way, that the Galway County Council um, funded a massive playground? So that playground was revitalised, I think, 15 years ago. And there's yes. no way, there's no way that 15 years ago there wasn't rumours or there wasn't some information well, about what was. was underneath. Martin, listen to this. The organisation knew it's criminal activity. It never sold that plot of land, that little plot of land. They never sold because they knew what was there. Then, then when the game was up, what did they do? They went to a PR firm, Terry Perone, to go out and say there were famine babies. When they knew, when they knew that was a lie, so here they were covering their lies upon lies upon lies. That's what they did. And what about the two boys 
that went to playing there by accident and fell over and the tomb cracked open, the, the septic tank opened and was the only all the boys saw was 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 skeletons of children. And they quickly uh, the child took it out, his father came along, they quickly put back, called the parish priest, resealed it up, pretended nothing happened. And the nun went there every year to pretend she was trying to grow a garden in there that was part of not there was nothing. It was hiding their sins, it was hiding the filth that they did. The, 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 to put your children into a septic tank, you can't not I, it's even hard for me to grasp a word to describe it. You can't put roses in this, you can't perfume it up. No. It's a septic tank. A septic tank is a fucking septic tank, excuse my French. That's, that's and a few years they'll never, again. They will never be able to justify that. And then when they were caught out with the lie with a PR firm, they hired a PR firm to perfume it up. To perfume it up. To say, oh, there were famine babies, as if that was acceptable. It's not, none of it was acceptable. But I, yes. I suppose, do you have any information, or is there any information on how, not that it matters, but just how the babies died or, like, how did they... Well, this, well, well, this is the problem. You see, the thing is, they were refused. A lot of children, yes, I accept that they're, they died from normal diseases. I accept that as well. And also, the, the nuns wouldn't spend anything on medicines. The children died of starvation. Yeah. No child. The government paid for per child in there. There's no excuse. You never saw a starving nun. That's true. And the nuns were making profit on the Magdalene laundry. And they were running the local hospital in tomb as well. And what about the grove? What about the, the hundreds of bodies in the grove across the way to the hospital? That, that is another, th- another question that has to be answered. Uh, because yes. there are stories about that too. Yes, and that's the point I'm making. You can't believe a word. You, you need for, people need to get away from something. I, I heard a number of years, two years ago, on the Joe Duffy show. I was on the Joe Duffy show, but prior to that, Two days ago, nuns came came on the show. I don't think Joe had interviewed her. I think he must have been his day off and someone else was doing it. And this person was talking to two little old nuns. He says, the little old nun says, uh, we, must let time, we, we must let time go by. It was another time. We've done our best. Done your best, sister. Yeah. I'm alive. There's 800 children in a fucking septic tank. Babies. Mm-hmm. Who put them there? Little or nonsense. Oh, we should let things go by. We we shouldn't hold these things. Hold them. How insulting was that? Yeah. The rascal is to begin. I'm living here. I live here. I came here to find my mother. I have brothers and sisters that are in similar septic tanks. You take any other home. Forget. Okay, put two of them out of the way a minute. Bessborough House. The nuns said, the nuns have said, they don't know where the grave is of 1,000 children. Sunday Wells, there's hundreds of women and children in secret graves. That's where my mom died. My mom is there. She committed no crime. She was worked herself to death and died. They dumped her into her grave like a piece of trash. Then you got Artane Industrial School. You got hundreds of boys beaten to death in graves. You got Leather Frack. You have 147 children, boys, in graves that committed no, uh, no crime. The Sacred Heart in Castle Pollard, 220 deaths, and there's more than that. Sean Ross Abbey, Philomena, Ross Cray, County Tipperary, you got a thousand children dead, unaccounted for. And you got St. Patrick's, where I was born, the biggest mother baby home in Ireland. You have maybe seven to nine to 12,000 babies and children and mothers dumped Jeez in graves. Christ Almighty. And that's only a few. We have. Uh, we, we have quite a few institutions. That's only eight, eight institutions, nine institutions that I talked about. And there's quite a few more. And so people need to take their head out of the sand and realize we're not talking about Germany. We're not talking about the Nazi. We're talking about little old Ireland here. And that's the shock. That's the shock. And the world is waiting to see what's the tomb. They've used every stall tactic to stall us off. Now it's to hide the files. Why hide the files? To hide the files because it's what's in the files. The fires will come out eventually. It's them lying day in and day out to the Irish people. It's insulting. It's not to do with religion. A criminal organization took over this country. And that's what happened. The right wing of the Catholic Church took over this country. And they dictated the policies. And for this, you have more than half a million people. Imagine a country the size of us had half a million, a quarter of a million or more in industrial schools. Imagine having this industrial school of children. Imagine your mother working the Magdalene laundry for nothing as slaves for the Catholic Church and built the power of the Catholic Church. And of course... You're, that's you're... what happened to my... That's happened to my mother. What? My mother committed no crime. 
I was born under wedlock, so what? That's not an excuse to throw into jail and treat her as dirt and filth. You're 100% right. Um, like, as I, as I wrote, I was telling you a while ago about the poem that I wrote, you know, Cage for Being Human. Like, having sex is a human thing. It's, of course only, it is. it's only made dirty through the perspective of people who are meant to be celibate. But you see, they can't be celibate. Sure, how are they celibate when they're off how raping children? Raping children. Listen, the Rhyme Report talks about brothers being moved from industrial school to industrial school. There were organised gang rapes of children. I called the, the industrial school the rape room of the clerics. Believe you me, yeah. trust me in this. Most children in these places were raped. That's a fact. They couldn't use the word rape because it's a male thing. That's fine. That's their demons to deal with. You speak to any survivor, it is a fact. I know this for a fact. I've spoke to many survivors. I know my own experience. I know my own journey. I'm yeah. not afraid to use the word anymore because it no longer fears me. It needs to be said what happened. And no one should tone police you either. This is what pisses me off. Like, uh, let, let's use a word that's more palatable to the ears of people that are privileged enough to have never gone through it. When, no, it's, we shouldn't. You should use whatever word you want to use. Yes, if you want to use it, use it. Exactly what happened to me. I imagine, um, okay, God forbid, a girl goes up the court or a boy goes up the court. And he can't use the word what happens to them. So they go up and say, oh, I was abused. Abuse is a slap, pulling your hair, pulling your nose. Yeah. There's nothing worse than an animal who comes at you as a child and physically rapes you. Yeah. That's not abuse. That is an animal, a criminal act of an animal, right? If that was a, a dog that did that, you put it down. Yeah. And, and, and when it comes to children, they got away with it because they had religion in front of their name. They had religion. That's why they got away with it, because religion was there. If all the McDonald's I told you about earlier on had a uh, Catholic in front of it, nobody would care if there was if there were babies in their septic tanks. Can I ask, it. Take away the religion. Can I ask you then, why do you think the government have, and, and let's face it, they've rushed through this one, why do you think, and let's not say the whole government either, because it was only Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Green Party, and I think two independents um, backed this, and the president signed it in. Now, yes, it can be challenged, and yes, it will be challenged. And for anyone listening to this podcast, by the way, I'm going to include a link. It's a fundraising link. Uh, it's on Uplift. And it's to help people raise money to challenge this in court because, unfortunately, victims need to now raise money in order to challenge this bill to stop them from sealing the records. Their own records, by the way, for everyone listening. It's their records that they're sealing and they're hiding behind the seal and keeping it in the dark. But on a question to you, Felix, from your perspective, why do you think the government, what are they hiding and, and why is there still such a fear within the government? And this is only like me, uh, hypothetically speaking, I don't know because I don't know the, the ins and outs. But why do you think there's still that fear where the government are going to literally lose public support to rush this thing through to hide these records for 30 years? What's in it for them? And the hidden power of the Catholic Church, you're dealing with an organisation though might be down, has got enormous power still in this country. They control the schools. Could you imagine opening up the prisons and letting all the paedophiles out and then telling them they're going to run the schools? Wow, yeah. Uh, that answers the question. The second thing, here's something that the bishop said in the late 40s and believed in. We must hasten this process with cold ruthlessness in eliminating this scourge from our pure Irish society, those unwed women, travellers, their filth and their offsprings. This is from the, 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 the collective Irish bishops in the late 40s that set the policies for the 40s, 15th century of marginalising travellers, orphans, unmarried women, and then allowed them to, to, commit, to commit the worst, heinous crimes on them. Because they were martyred, and this was encouraged by the bishops. Well, I, you know what, and, and you know, like we, there isn't enough talked about that. That, in my mind, is clear and clear cut fucking fascism. And you know what, this is coming from the same Catholic Church to support the Nazis anyway. So, like, are, are we really that surprised? Uh, at this, it's two, 2020, and we're having this conversation around the government sealing records that don't belong to them. Yes. In the hope of... It's absolutely outrageous. I can find no record of my mum because of the obstruction. They used cleverly used the Data Protection Act to even find my own brother and sister. 
And one of my brothers is still alive. He's 20 years older than me, and I'm not allowed. He's not allowed to come near me, and I'm not allowed to touch him because the data protection. It's outrageous. I can't find out. I know where mom is. I know where she's dumped the buried phone. Where I'm not allowed anything. This is my own flesh and blood. Everyone's a right to know who the mom is, the family is, and find them. That's that's a basic United Nations Charter of rights to that. I'm denied that. It's but a right to right, right to a family. You're you're dead right. It is covered under, under yes. the right to a family. It, Yes, and there were many there were many children these orphans didn't even know the, the boy or girl they were playing with were their brothers and sisters. They never knew. Many discovered 50, 60 years later. And so you've lost all that time. What time can you make up with, with family you've lost like that? And you want to hear the story. To, you, you, it's gone. It's sad. But let, let me talk about what, what else was outrageous that went on in these places. Okay, you had rapes of thousands of men, of, of boys and, and women. Right, slaves there. Then you had slavery. I worked, the industrial schools were there to make money. I worked as a slave. I made the shoes. I worked at carpentry. I, I, I tilled the fields out in the back. We, we all did this. It was for money to feed the town people of Tralee. That's that. So the justice of that. Then there were illegal drug experiments. Imagine. I and heard about fact, those actually, Felix. Uh, vaccinations and things like that, the testing. Yes. And they were yes. paid for it. Yes, and the companies made the companies made a fortune. There were thousands of orphans in these schools, in, in these in these industrial schools and in the in the mother baby homes were experimented on to improve drugs. And many hundreds died. And when they died, their bodies were then sold by the religious orders to guess where? Yeah, what? They they were sold to the universities and sold to the medical schools. I was just gonna say but and many of them are still kept in glass jars on display in these places, which Fuck is even more outrageous. It's, that's like, like, I don't even know where, where to go with that. That's like something out of a fucking horror movie. Do you know, and it's, it's like, excuse me for cursing, by the way, for anyone listening. I have been trying to curse less, but this is an emotive topic and there's no policing of tone or, or, or words in this episode. And, and I will give a warning at the start of it. This is, this is, it's, we, we have a right to be angry. And in actual fact, my generation needs to be more angry about this. Um, and I, do you know what? When, you, when we were talking there about the testing uh, for these big, massive pharmaceutical companies and that, is there is there any public record of the pharmaceutical companies? Yes, that pro- yes I, I, I have actual fact. I have, uh, I have some of the reports myself. I'm a collector of rare books and stuff. So I have some of the reports myself. The government has actually released the report, which I, I got to put up on my site. Uh, there was a debate on this, and they acknowledge, um, but very low numbers, but they do say the range from 75 orphans to as high as 286, or even higher, uh, died because of the drug experiments. But remember, the children that survived the drug experiments, many of them later on, years afterwards, had held problems relating to the drugs were done and subsequently died. So the ones that died, died within a few days. They, they never intervened. They used to watch a child die. They'd stand by the bed and watch the child trashing and dying because the drug didn't work in the child. But they'd never interfere to save the child. They'd move aside and do it. it was and an another experiment. Thing, a lot of people, and a lot of people don't know this, and I have a, a record to this. In, in the 50s, a couple of the doctors that were that were used on these experiments actually were ex-Nazi junior doctors who came out of the concentration camps and were passed through the rat lines of Spain, Catholic Spain, Catholic Portugal, and given free access into Ireland. There were ex-Nazis who were waiting, and these done some of these experiments, and then were given passports, Irish passports, and sent down to South America. That's absolutely crazy. I didn't know yeah. any of that now. And I tell you what... Yeah. It, if 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 there's records, if you have if you've got records and, and written records, first off, what is the name of your website so we can get we can direct people towards your website? Chewingbabies.org. So Chewingbabies, which is T U A M, babies.org. For anyone listening, I do recommend uh, taking a look and and especially the articles that you've written. You've I, I said this to you before we started recording. That you have a fantastic way with words, and do you remember what I was saying? That you're so yeah. descriptive, because I think what's lost, and you've you've touched on it several times here, is that we have been told that we can't be descriptive about it, i.e., it's abuse, not rape. 
So choosing words that, that makes the, the listeners more comfortable, that's not necessarily the right thing because nobody has the right to tone police and nobody has the right to say, oh, you should say it this way because people will take it better. It's not about that. It's about the truth now at this stage. Um, yes. But, but one more, I'll, I'll ask you one more question then, um, Felix, because I have a funny feeling we could talk for hours. Uh, unfortunately, this episode is running it's running fairly long, but I, I I don't want to stop you talking either. Um, but I do want to ask this one question, For, in regards to this uh, new bill that has been passed and the sealing of the of the records. How how have you personally been affected by it, and what do you think the Irish people at this stage needs to do? Well, look, if if a law has to be passed to hide records. Right. Mm-hmm. The fact that the fact that the government it, it didn't even pass it wasn't even passed in the house. They just done done this bill hastily, and then they got the president at midnight practically to sign it. It wasn't it wasn't approved by anything. It's 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 so outrageous, unbelievable. It's insulting to every survivor. Do you know it's like the Nazis uh, hiding all their own records and pretending not went on that all was roses, all is well here, and uh, there's nothing to see here. Move on. It's a distraction to one area while they're doing something else elsewhere. We should be focused on what's in the what's in the septic tank in Toome, because Toome has to be right. Toome has to be, we have to do that right because that has to be duplicated in every other institution. We're going to go through a lot of pain with this, but survivors, we go through this all the time. They need to get this out of the way. We, we need to lance this. Stop lying to the Irish people. Stop pretending and stop using these, these useful idiots to carry the message who are not survivors, pretending they're survivors, who speak for survivors. That's bullshit. Right. We, we, we really need to be honest, have an honest reckoning here and deal with this. Uh, and then they, they cleverly just put off a commission to do this and that. It's outrageous. The President of Ireland, by the way, wrote about the industrial schools in the 70s and 80s. You cannot find this record. I can't get a copy of this, and I'm a collector. He wrote about what went on in these places, and you can't find any publication of it. You can't find it. It's a bit suspect, isn't it? It is worse than suspect. So imagine the insult. We we moved on in Ireland. I'm I was thrilled to come back to Ireland and see we moved on. We we've taken uh, marriages, gay marriages, divorce, even abortion. Great. I've seen Ireland come forward. But we need a reckoning to what went on, what the church did in this country. They ran this country from 1916 on. We really need a proper reckoning to what to what they did in their name, not in our name, because they really seize control of this country. And, and it's how they treated the women. As society is judging how it treats its women and children, we failed. To I... lock up, for no reason, hundreds of thousands of women because they weren't married and had children, and then locked their children up, and then called them scum of the earth, and called the travellers worse than, than I wouldn't even use some of the words they were called, and then marginalised them, and beat them to death, raped them and beat them to death, and pretend nothing has gone on. And said, "Well, we tried to do our best. Uh, it, uh, it was different. Time. It was so long ago. Let's pretend it didn't happen." No, I'm still here. As long as I can speak and read, and and think, I'll never let it die. But I can, can I can only speak for me. I can't speak for any other survivor. But I feel their pain every day, and I owe it to all the thousands that went before me. I owe it to every single one of them. My friends, I grew up with, I played with. They're gone. My memories of Patsy are wonderful, but they're gone. His life was less. They made it less. They treated him less. They beat him less. They raped him. They did everything they could to him. And then he he had no other option. He thought the easiest option was just go and finish it. And he did. And that was sad. And remember, the second they closed all the schools, they closed them all together. And guess what happened? Two things happened. All the all all the prisons fill, filled up with 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 children to come out of here because they didn't know how to live. They went to stole a loaf of bread. They were in jail. The next thing that happened was all the lunatic asylums were filled up, and then the abuse started all over again. They experimented them on. They 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 they, they parted their brains out. They ill treated. They beat up to death. And many of the lunatic asylums have secret cemeteries as well. The church claims there's nothing to do with that. Of course it is. The church put them there. Because a boy said that he was raped by a priest. The priest turned around and said, well, he must be gay. And, and, and that's the shock. And that's the shock. But here's what, here's what a priest said. And this is true. Here's what a priest said. He claims that uh, children, uh, he said, it's okay for priests to rape children 
because children were, were seeking tenderness. What? Yes, the French priest who gathered online. He claims the child rape is not violence, but is tenderness, and that children raped by clerics were willing, willing victims seeking tenderness from the rapist. Dirty, who disgusting bastards is what they are, okay? Yeah, Dirty, disgusting that, bastards. Yeah. And, and there's no, there, there is, I'm sorry, but there is no, there's no redeemable quality for any person who does any of the things that you've mentioned or that Trish has mentioned or any other survivor has mentioned. There's absolutely no justification. And I'm telling you now, clearly, where I stand on it, there's no justification for this government to hide these records. And that's the there whole point of this. Because they have a lot to fear. They have a lot to fear. They were afraid. They were afraid for them. They are afraid for the church. Let the church fall. Let something better come come along. I couldn't Religion. care less. I couldn't care less. There needs to be separation yeah. of church and state anyway. Yeah, yeah, and 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 and, and I agree. And and, it's, Wait, and, and you know what? It's nothing to do with the religion. It's nothing to do with the religion for me. It's That's to do with step. the abuse of power, the power dynamics that was there, and the fact that they still have this power to to push the government to vote in a certain way to lock. Yeah. And and let's look at the realistic impact of this seal. This seal is for thirty years. They're hoping that you and all the other survivors will be dead by the time that the seal is lifted. Of course, when you Martin, That's disgusting. When you break, Martin, when you try to break silence. There is always resistance. And that's the problem here. They're afraid of, of you and me. They're afraid of you, Martin, because one is you're articulated, you can speak. They're afraid of me because I'm a survivor and I can do the same. And that's the fear they have. Sadly, many survivors are broken. Even today, it's it's terrible to see. It breaks my heart to see it. You are they I'm still lead, they're still lead treated. I'm still ill treated by this bill. This bill is an insult to me. You imagine saying the same to uh, to the Jews. You can't have your records. Uh, we're going to see it for the next hundred years. We don't care what what they did inside there to you. We don't care. That's an insult. It is That's an insult. And then to hide behind and create a law to do it that wasn't even passed by the houses, by the two houses, by the Senate and 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 Dorland. It wasn't even passed by them. It is outrageous. And the president didn't even bring it to the Council of Ireland either for any kind of no, suggestions but, or co- a conversation around but, it. But why should he he's do what he's told? And that's that's how it is. And that's the problem here. See, it, it, do you know what? This wormhole goes deeper and deeper. Um, Felix, you, and, and I need to say this, you were an absolute inspiration. I, I know you're going to take this and say, well, no, I'm just a survivor and I'm doing all I can. But that's fair enough. But for me... As as a as a thirty five year old Irish person, who by the way I'm not overly religious, you know I'm not. I I I believe in being nice to people, and and maybe nice things will come back to me. But hearing this, and I grew up in a time when the likes of the Magdalene Laundries were were, were on the TV screen when you had Song for a Raggy Boy or the Magdalene Martyrs, and I I remember watching those and learning from that, and then to learn later on that I was playing on a fucking playground that was built over the dead babies that was thrown into a shit pit, into into a, a sewer, into uh, do you know, like septic, a, septic a septic tank. tank. A septic tank is for human waste. And then so for the hundreds of thousands of euros orders. to be built, uh, to be spent on building a playground. How, how demonic can you get where you build a playground, invest huge money in a playground that's built on the graves, not even the graves, on a, on a septic tank full of 800 odd babies? How how demonic can you get where that's allowed to happen? And and the children are still there, and they'll still be there because the power of both the church and the government. The government are fearful of the international press of this. I get to put the story out in time, but six years, six years. There's no excuse, none, none. The children shouldn't be there. It's outrageous, and and that's where Ireland needs to wake up. It's outrageous. Each child should be taken out with dignity. Yes. identified and given a proper burial. And the reason why the nuns put them in there, by the way, a lot of people don't get this, because the nuns were afraid to put them in the, the cemetery nearby, which is only across the road, as you know, Martin, is this. They were they were fearful that hundreds of women every single year or every single day would, visit. would come to visit their children in the yeah. graveyard. Yeah. So hiding them and putting them in and flushing them into a septic tank where nobody could see them was was more insulting than anything else. It showed that they, how they really felt about the children. They were worse than shit. Well, you know what? This bill is no different than that fucking uh, septic yes. tank because it's they're the exact enabler. same thing. They're, their enablers continue our pain. 
by doing this, by the government doing this and hiding behind this law and pretending all is rosy. They're enabling these people that did this to these children. They're the same as far as I'm concerned. It's outrageous. Look, for 30 years, all they're expecting is to put your tears into darkness and to keep it behind the seal because that serves their benefit. But on that note, Felix, I have to say, you look, you're enlightening, you're an extremely articulate man and you're well versed in all this. I'd love to have you back on um, a little bit down the line again and have another discussion, maybe about your books as well. We haven't even touched on that today. Um, <laughs> but I Just do call. I do want to say that I'm honoured that you've come on and that you felt safe enough to open up about your own, I suppose, your own history and your own what happened to you in life. And I can't understate how important it is for voices like yours to come out. And I'm really honoured that you, you share that on, on this platform. Now, I do hope that mainstream media, if anyone's listening on mainstream media, uh, I only have a certain reach. I don't get paid for this. I'm not state funded like, like other organisations. Get people like Felix on. Get get their voices out there. Do what you can within the media. Get their voices out there. I'm only starting off in this game. And if I can do it, if I could put... The, and this is a comedy podcast. Imagine I'm taking the chance to, to put this out there on a comedy podcast. Do the right thing, people. If you're a journalist, get in touch with Felix. Check out tunebabies.org. Felix, as much as a, this, this conversation is going to stay with me, and I hope it does because it'll be a, a nice little reminder of, of what I can do to keep promoting what you guys are doing, the survivors. But thank you so much for coming on this show. It meant a lot. It really, really did. Martin, just, just one other thing too. Few people talk that um, percentage-wise of, of, of the travelling community within the institutions. I reckon uh, probably a third of the, the children in where I was at St. Joseph's were travellers. That's I can know. assure you I would be surprised if any of them survived. And you know what, uh, Felix? The, it was only recently we got uh, ethnic recognition. So before that, they would have been t- put down as vagrants or itinerants. They wouldn't have been given uh, an no, ethnic identifier. No, they were identifier. put down. No, Martin, that's not true. They were put down as parasites. They were treated as parasites and they were killed. And that's the shock. That it well, it is. And you know what? Uh, There's we, nothing wrong with them. I have wonderful memories, but my God, to what they did to them was, I know what they did to me, but what they did to Pats and the others because of, 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 of they were travellers, which I didn't understand was more than outrageous. I can't get any more outraged than I am. And but justifiably so, and it's not about, the, the onus should not be on you to be outraged. The onus is on society to be outraged on your behalf. It's it's us that have failed. We have been 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 brought down this little rabbit hole to believe the government. Now they're after rushing this thing in. Very few questions. Yes, there are some protests now, but people they're 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 not comfortable with the truth of, of something like that because it's a big battle, and a lot of people are just hoping. Well, if somebody else will do it, somebody else will fight for them. Somebody else will bring it up. There isn't somebody else. We are the somebody else's. You know, we need to be doing this. But as yeah. I said, you know, I'm delighted that you were able to talk to me today and I'm I'm really, I, I am honoured that you were able to open up because it's not an easy thing to open up, um, especially about, about things like that. Uh, but look, I will be in touch with you in the future and I look, even off, off air, I want to have more conversations with you and maybe have a look at your book collection as well. Oh, <laughs> I think you'll have a field day looking at my books. <laughs> I got, I got quite a few fans. I restore books as well, Mark. I, I restore books. I, I'm quite proud of the way that I, my restoration. And I'm only custodying my books for future uh, generations. If you lose your books, you've lost your culture. Well, that's one thing. And we're, we are well aware of that because our language was never written down and it's been whitewashed out of the history books. Exactly. Felix O'Neill, I want to say thank you so much again. And take care and if there's anything we can do so by the way it's tunebabies.org and I will also put up the links to the fundraiser Felix and Neil thank you so much for joining us on the Has Been Show thank you Mark we'll be in touch alright thank you stay safe bye bye so I have to say thank you so much to, to Felix um, we just that, that that discussion for me has it's definitely affected me and I was in two minds about sharing this song. It's a, it's a poem that I wrote and I put it up on, on social media yesterday. And it's about it's called Repeal the Seal. Now, I don't, for anyone that knows me, I don't have a great voice. I'm not a singer. I'm a stand-up comedian. But I'm also a poet. And I wrote these words and they were full of meaning and it meant a lot to me to write them. And I asked a few people if it was, you know, appropriate for me to even put this out there. 
I wrote from the perspective of the survivors. This, and then I put it to the music of, well, with the help of Chris Stewart, who does the sound on this podcast, we put it to the music of Christy Moore's fantastic song, The Voyage. So it was kind of like a spoken word poem, and then we ended, I ended up singing. But look, the point is, I wrote this song, and I want you to listen to it. It's not the best song, but the words have, are full of meaning. And if you're a singer, if you're an actual singer with talent, and you like the words, and you like the flow of the song, feel free to get in touch. I'd love for you to sing it properly, because I think I think somebody with some actual singing talent can do this a lot of justice. But again, it's all about the message behind the song. It, it affected me on a deep, deep level, and I was I, I felt compelled to write it. Um, unfortunately, as I said, I don't have the talent to sing it. But if you can do better, do get in touch, and we'll talk about it. And for everyone out there that's listening, and if you're a survivor and you've gone through these institutions, you you are brave, you are loved, you we are sorry that we didn't listen, we are sorry that our government has let you down again, but we're here now. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're not a survivor, remember, you are privileged. You did not have to live through it. I did not have to live through it. We need to do something now to help those that did have to live through it. Let's repeal the seal, guys. Come on. I'm a survivor. You are the state. You signed into law to hide the hate. Sealed all of our records, it's us, you have failed For 30 years, while our stories go stale But no one to save us, just us on our own Empty promises from those on the throne We still hear the cries as our souls disembark You cannot see our tears in the dark Life is a battle We deserve to win Cage for being here Masquerading a sin We need your help And our stories reveal Give voice to the voiceless Repeal the seal Life is a battle We deserve a win for being human masqueraded as sin We need your help and our stories reveal Give voice to the voiceless Repeal the seal Thanks again for tuning in to this episode of The Has Been Show. The Has Been Show is available on all platforms. Do check us out on Facebook, which is The Has Been Show, or on Twitter, has beens, at Has Beens There. If you can, we would really, really appreciate it if you could subscribe to our Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com forward slash The Has Beens Show. The has beens is spelled T H E H A Z B E A N Z S H O W. Thank you so much. The Has Beens podcast is presented by me, Martin Beans Ward. On sound and sound engineering is Chris Jura. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you next time. It's Beans in a pod, but this pod is traveling.